Ravi on uh, third year. So the first two lectures were about like diagnosing injuries. So we'll be talking about uh, treating uh, pain. Uh, so we're we'll doing an introduction to nerve blocks. So I want to start out with the case. Um, so uh, it's 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. They're set up in the back of the pod. Um, the CTC clears over this patient to you in 27, right? So it's the patient that you can see in your line of sight. Um, maybe they're moaning and they're in pain. So you pull up their imaging, you see this. Uh, ortho's already been consulted, last year drawn. So what are your next steps? All right. So um, this is the, the last book I read that was non-medical. Um, <laughs> um, so basically, this is, you know, you choose your own adventure. Great book. Um, so, so we have two options, right? So option A is kind of the more traditional path, right? You order your morphine. Um, the patient you know, has comorbidities to get admitted to medicine, right? Uh, the medicine intern overnight, they're kind of swamped. The ED nurse is calling them. So saying the patient can't sleep, they're in pain, so they order you know, two of IV added in. Uh, patient, of course, they aspirate, they develop aspiration pneumonia. Um, they're discharged to a nursing home 20 days later. So that's option A. Um, you can do that, that's fine. Um, <laughs> there is option B, though. Uh, option B is to perform a fascia early after ball. Um, their hospitalization goes great. Um, they love you while you're in the ED, super happy. They're discharged home, and they get to attend their, their first grandchild's wedding. Uh, <laughs> so we, dance the night away. Yeah, so <laughs> definitely not biased, all right? Okay, so um, overview. So I'm gonna go through the benefits and indications of some of the more common uh, nerve blocks for the ED. Uh, we'll go over the basics of like how to perform clock safely, and then go through some complications. All right, so it's going to be interactive, so you'll see an image, so I want you to tell me the basic fracture um, and or an injury and what nerve block you can do. I can do so. Let's call it out. This is an easy one. In your virtual canvas there. Yeah. <laughs> A hip fracture. All right, cool. And what nerve block can you do? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can do a fascia iliac block. Um, this is just the from this is from NY Sora. It's a great website. They basically have like the uh, this is a sensory uh, innervation for the block. Um, so great. Next one. Everyone's favorite CCT procedure. Oh, chest. Chest, right? But what block can you do? Intercostal. Intercostal, uh, anything else? There's some blog posts. Serratus. Yeah, serratus interior. Um, great. Um, so serratus interior, the plain block, so there's not really the big, uh, you're going to be blocking the intercostals. Um, great, so this is a um, good thing you could do periprocedurally um, to reduce their pain. Okay. Move along. I mean, I don't see it as common, not really deep. It's an arm. It's an abscess, yeah. So deltoid abscess. Anything you guys can think of? Blocks? Anyone zoom can answer to you? Yeah. Axillary? Axillary, nice. Um, you axillary or inner scaling block. Great, so this is just the inner addition. Great. Um, how about this one? Another procedure, CCT. Um, central line, right? IJ. Uh, you can do a block for this as well. Besides just being local. Cervical, yeah. Superficial cervical. Yeah, so you can do super, superficial cervical crisis block. Right, so this could be for your patient who's agitated. Um, they're going to be a hard procedure, so you can just do this is a quick and simple block you can do. Um, and we'll, here's the last one. There's the arrows that points it out. Let's look for it. Posterior fracture, right? Um, and you anyone have a block they can do? It's Breville's favorite block. Dr. Spiney. Yeah, there you go. 
Um, so you can do records by the And that's more for posterior fractures. Um, this is anterior, anterior, so you won't really get coverage for the posterior fractures. All right, so some, these are some of the more common indications for nerve loss. Um, so why do it? Um, I know in the ED we get excited about making the diagnosis. Um, this, but with the patients, why do they come to the ED? It's really for, to treat their pain, right? That's what they want. Um, so if you're doing nerve blocks to treat their pain, um, this is something that I would argue is safer um, than giving uh, systemic opioids. Um, there's a lot of complications, especially in like, the elderly population. Um, there's also for, if you have like a large territory, so if you like a large burn um, or laceration, um, instead of doing a large uh, local, where you might be concerned about the dosing of the anesthetic, you can just do a nerve block, right? Um, and lastly, for things that might have in the past had to go to the OR, use conscious sedation, perhaps you can just do a nerve block, right? So it will save you time and the save there. All right. So, of course, you didn't think you'd be able to get away without any EBM from my lecture. So here's uh, three studies briefly. Most of the literature for a nerve box is from the anesthesia and in the OR. Um, it's kind of a more newer emerging topic in uh, emergency medicine. So the first one, um, basically, was just, uh, this was done by anesthesiologists. It's for fascial iliacal blocks. Basically, it was an RCT, but they did fascial iliacal block and placebo IM versus morphine IM and placebo uh, fascial block. And they basically showed um, there's all limitations, obviously. Um, they didn't use ultrasound for this one, but this basically showed um, there was better uh, faster onset to um, pain management um, and less complications doing the block for hip fractures. The second one is done at MIMO. This is like 20 ED patients with suspected hip fractures. Um, and that's what the chart here is on the left. Basically, this is time versus the pain. So these, these all got uh, ED performed specially at the box. Uh, there's no complications, and the, the pain uh, is reduced. So this is not a great study. It's very low quality. There's no control. There's a lot of uh, placebo effect. But this is something that shows it's feasible um, and effective. Um, the last one is a systematic review meta-analysis. Um, there's 13 studies. Um, this one was kind of showing ultrasound versus no ultrasound. So neurostem is what uh, anesthesiologists uh, used to do more commonly. Um, basically, for every outcome, they showed that ultrasound was superior, meaning that there was less conversion to general anesthesia, sort of shorter uh, onset to um, pain control, um, and there was less intravascular uh, punctures. Um, again, limited, not super, um, not the best uh, study that's relevant to us, it was done by anesthesiologists, but it kind of shows that um, in general, ultrasound uh, is the safer way to do it uh, for the nerve blocks. All right, so now going into how to perform the blocks. So before you actually do the block, there's a lot of stuff you have to do. Um, so of course, you wanna make sure you're doing uh, a safe block and that's indicated. So you're going to uh, speak with your consulting services. So that the trauma uh, or the medicine and make sure that they know that you're doing a block, right? Um, and make sure that's indicated. So some things that you wouldn't want to do is that if you're worried for a compartment syndrome, um, maybe this is not the time you want to do the block, all right? So you want to get consent first. Um, Neurovascular exam. So I want to make sure you do a good exam before and after the walk, right? So you want to document that they have what their findings were so that if you pass the walk, you want to make sure that um, there's no complications, like there's no nerve injury. So that's why it's really important to do a good exam before and after. Um, an ADA scan, I would argue that it's, uh, you should just do a quick scan with the ultrasound to so make sure that their anatomy is suitable for the walk. Right, before you waste all your time getting all the supplies and you look over there and they're not suitable for the box, so just do two, two seconds and just make sure the anatomy that you're expecting is there and they're a good um, patient for this. And then your basics, your monitor, and your equipment. And we'll go into the dosing. All right, so materials. All right, so you want to prevent infection, so you want to do this sterilely or semi sterilely. 
Um, so we'll get your gloves, first your um, sterile your pro cover. Um, the needle up here. Um, so in the OR, they use these needles. Um, basically, it's one tip and it's more echogenic. Um, and so the idea being is that it's safer and there's less risk of intravascular injections and intramural injections. So this is something hopefully we might be getting in our EDs soon. Um, but connected to it, there's uh, connection tubing. And so you'll be having the needle and then um, the tubing will be connected to a syringe that's filled with your uh, saline or your anesthetic. So these are sort of all your supplies. Um, all right, so Jeopardy question. All right, um, so uh, Inca's first discovered this anesthetic. Uh, William Hall said it's probably doing the first uh, block, I mean, block in 1884 using this agent. Anyone? What is it? Pivocaine. What's that? Pivocaine. Pivocaine, no. Pivocaine was not the first anesthetic. I think Hall said he's kind of a druggie. Mm -hmm. Cocaine. Who said that? I don't know if I can reach you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So cocaine. Okay, some sparkles. All right. So talking about the anesthetics, right? So uh, the graph, the chart on the left. Um, these are some of the more common anesthetics that uh, we have to use. Uh, at County and Downstate, we basically have Lido and Vivicane. Um And we have like Vendicane, of course, on the topical stuff. Um, so at the top is more of your shorter acting, or at the bottom is the longer acting. In general, um, the longer acting agents have higher molecular weight and more liquid soluble. And because of that, they are because they're more potent, they also are higher risk for systemic toxicity. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so in general, for like your longer acting box, uh, that'd be like your fascial acting. So maybe you want to do uh, long acting pain control, it would use something like lipidocaine or ropidocaine. Whereas for like your shorter block, you're using a lack repair, you would use something shorter um, like lidocaine for us or two part of protein. If you actually have a pain All right. Any questions? How yeah. long are we talking for these cocaine? So the duration, it's um, it kind of depends on your technique and the volume of a lot of factors, um, but it can last up to six to eight hours to up to twelve hours um, in general. All right. So another quiz. All right. So you have your fifty kilogram woman, right? The hip fracture. So maybe you saw a good lecture and you're inspired to do a block. Um, so what's your maximum safe dose for lupidocaine? So take, say you're doing sunship, how would you order it? How do you know how much volume to order? Max three. What's that? Three makes per take at the max. So you can look up at your, I would recommend like looking up a resource. So here's couple to save locals an app that's free. I'm not paid by it, paid for it, for promoting it. It's something I use and you can basically click the anesthetic and we'll tell you, you can list your comorbidities um, and it will tell you the safe dose. This is from Highland. Basically they recommend two mix for people. Right? So someone who's um, 50 kilograms, right? So it'd be 100 mix and if it's 0.5% concentration, so it'd be uh, 20 mLs, right? Other things you can do if you only have 0 0.5, say you want to give a larger volume, if you're doing a uh, fascially active block, if you want to give 40 cc's, what you can do is give, you can just dilute it with sterile saline, one to one. Um, so then you have a 0 0.25 concentration. So these blocks, it's more about the volume, but uh, then it's, it's about the exact uh, concentration. You want to bathe with the nerves. So I recommend like, looking up these, um, before you're doing like a block, you should know what the safe dose is. I right? so you're not going to more than that. I've seen like uh, ortho um, say, like, oh, can I have another 20 cc bottle, 2% Lido? And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so. All right, so how to, let's go more into the steps of doing the block, right? So preparation, preparation is really important. Um, so this is a quote of Bob Knight. He said, I don't believe in luck, I believe in preparation. Uh, 
This is also Bobby Knight, so maybe for Bobby Knight. He's a little bit of a hothead. Um, he's throwing a chair, which is famous for. But he believed in preparation, that's the key point. Um, so along with preparation, so his positioning, this is something I'm pretty bad at. Um, something that, so basically, um, who's going to make this shot? Who's in better positioning? No, it's not Julian. Julian's he's off balance. Also, the guy on the right is a professional, um, so he's going to make the shot. Julian missed the shot. Um, so you basically want to think about your positioning. Um, you don't want to be doing like uh, doing block it behind you, behind the black block, uh, block. You're going to hurt yourself, and it's going to be more dangerous for the patient. So here's an example of good positioning, right? Um, so let's go through some of the things we see. Right, so you're holding the probe in your non-dominant hand, right? Um, with your dominant hand, um, ideally you'll be, this is a one-person uh, technique, ideally you'll be doing a two-person technique. Um, so you'll be using your dominant hand to stabilize the needle. Um, so the ultrasound, right, it's the machine that's right in front of you, so you're not, you're not bending your neck to look at it. Um, and then you're supporting the patient's uh, arm, right? So this is good positioning. Of course, you know, bling is always good. Apple Watch. Um, so verdicts, pretty good. Pretty good positioning. <laughs> All right. So um, as far as uh, how to actually do the scanning, again, so you want to do it in, in plane block. So unlike when you're doing like a, a central line or uh, ultrasound guided IV, you want, uh, when you're doing that out of plane, you want to do this in plane. So you want to see the whole needle by giving that the complications are when you don't see your needle tip. So you really have to practice in that you fix practice. Um, so basically you're gonna line it up with your vascular probe. So this is the image that you should see on the right. All right, cool. so and what does a, um, a nerve look like? So this is again the from the fascial lacrimal block. Um, so you have your, your navel, your anatomy, right? So your nerves can be lateral. So the nerve has this characteristic honeycomb appearance. The uh, reason why it looks like that is that the nerves run in the fascicles. So when you have a cross section, um, you can see like the, the nerve fibers. So this is the, you can't see that arrow, but the top right is a cross section of the honeycomb, um, and B is the lateral piece. So this is what, this is something that you could do on shift as well, um, if you're bored. Um, resting patients, you could um, practice on your colleague and just start looking for nerves and kind of recognizing um, pattern recognition. So, the next thing is hydro dissection. Um, so, here's a clip. Basically, you when you're doing like these uh, fascial uh, blocks, you want to make sure you're in the right plane. So, what you can do, um, you can actually can use serosaline. You just want to inject small amounts and you'll see the, uh, the layers peel away. Um, so this is called hydro dissection, and so this is um, this is a good technique. This is something you can practice, right? You could do this with local anesthetic, but again, if you're concerned about running out of volume, you can something you can start with the sterile saline and then switch over to your anesthetic once you're in the right position. All right. So again, I talk about two-person uh, technique. So you'll have your other provider. So you're stabilizing the needle, right, with your if you're on the person on the left. I'm the person on the right. Who is your attending? Um, or your colleague, they'll be injecting um, your saline or your anesthetic. All right, so this is kind of even more control of the needle. So it's kind of safer technique. All right, so just to recap, um, so the pearls, you know, getting your right positioning, <coughs> visualizing the needle tip, two provider technique, um, hydrogen section, some of the pitfalls, um, something again I've been a victim of, um, air and needle. Um, so just like an IV, you want to prep the line with saline. So if you inject air, air is artifact, right? So then it's going to obscure your view. Make sure you prep your needle line. And then, just like when you're doing an uh, upside guided IV, if you put too much pressure, you're going to collapse the veins, and you might miss that you're injecting into your uh, vasculature. So make sure you're not putting too much pressure uh, with the probe. All right, so the last 10 minutes, we're talking about the complications. All right, so nerve injury. Again, these are all Complications are in documents be pretty rare. Um, if you use good technique, um, the complications are pretty minimal. So basically, in nerve injury, you want to make sure that uh, you're not going, you don't want to 
inject directly into the nerve, you can just bathe the nerve. Um, so the concern is that if you have too small of a needle, you can actually uh, do an intraneural injection and cause uh, nerve damage. Uh, intravascular injection, um, we kind of spoke about as well. This is a major concern. Um, that you want to inject directly into your vasculature. And we'll cover these last three. So starting with allergic reactions. So true uh, allergic reactions are pretty rare with local anesthetics. Um, people who have reactions, um, either it's an intravascular injection that was unrecognized, um, or sometimes it's a metabolite. So the compound on the right, um, uh, that's um, PABA. So this is a metabolite from ester to benzocaine, um, uh, propane. Um, so sometimes the metabolite is actually causing the allergic reactions. Um, Sometimes it's like the preservative itself, so uh, methyl paraben is one of the preservatives. So if your patient really has an allergic reaction, you can try to figure out if, is it actually from the preservative or is it from the agent. Um, so there's the two eyes, first one eye rule, right? So you go back to the first chart, the amides and your esters. So the amides, uh, they'll have two eyes, um, just eye and amide. So if your benzocaine, not benzocaine, um, pivocaine, repivocaine, there's two eyes. Whereas benzocaine has one eye, those are your esters. So if you're allergic to one class, you actually can still get the other class. So quick way. All right, so last, local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Um, this is, will be on the boards, All right? Um, it's actually extremely rare, even though it's always on the boards. Um, the incidents, there was a um, review done by hospital with special surgery over five years, 2009 to 2014, um, which looked at 80,000 80, cases. Um, and they saw three instances of seizures that they thought would do the last. Um, so the, that's 0.05 for 1,000. Other document literature shows one in 1,000. So it's basically very rare. Um, I think the incidence has gone down with the use of ultrasound. Um, but basically, this graph is showing that um, just a stepwise progression. So you'll start with like the circumoral numbness, um, and then you'll get progressed as the, the serum concentration increases. You'll have progressive symptoms going to convulsions and ultimately cardiac arrest. So something you should be aware of. Um, this is usually um, associated with bupivacaine. Um, so Dr. Mayer said like every instance he saw the toxicol was uh, accidental um, injection with bupivacaine. Uh, and then Kilpatrick said, uh, sometimes you saw it like breast surgery. It's always with the condition. So what's the treatment for it? Um, generally, it's supportive. So if you have minimal symptoms, you're going to do the obvious stuff. They're hypotensive. You might start with some fluids. If you have a seizure, start with benzo. Um, it's just to point out, some things like lidocaine are known to cause seizures. So you can start with that. But if, ultimately, if they progress into cardiac arrest or fractured symptoms, uh, seizures, you want to be giving a lipid emulsion. Uh, I put up ECMO here. Uh, this, this is a, a good uh, use for ECMO. Um, in fact, this is something that's temporary. It should go away. So if you buy it in time, this is a good uh, use for ECMO. But all right, going on to lipid emulsion. So if you're going to be using Bupivacaine and getting a large amount, um, this is something that you should be prepared for. Um, so there's a website, Lipid Rescue. Um, they actually, it's a good resource, and they have, they recommend, um, they'll tell you exactly how to give lipid emulsion therapy. Basically, it's a bolus that you can repeat and then start a drip. Um, we have this, um, at Downside, there's a protocol. Uh, we don't have a protocol yet. Um, Kings County is the thing that we could implement. Um, but something, it's something to be aware of. Again, it's super rare, but something that you should have in the back of your mind. We have lipid emulsion, but we should have a protocol. Uh, some of the things is work for boards, uh, methemical anemia, right? If you have someone who got a endoscopy um, or you're doing a PTA drainage and you're using hurricane spray of benzocaine, um, this is one of the complications that you can get. You can get um, right, you get sinusitis and you get the dark blood. The treatment is methylene blue. All right, so kind of wrapping up um, in the future. Um, so I think. You know, as residents, this is a time where we should kind of develop our skills. Um, I think nerve blocking, that's it's safe and it's really um, a 
affected. So I think it's going to be more of the future for emergency medicine. So I think this is a good time to get more familiar, kind of push um, your attendings and yourselves to not just uh, admit the hip fracture, but try to take the time to do uh, the nerve block. So I think we'll become a better position and treat pain better. Um, hopefully we'll be getting, uh, working on getting uh, the some nerve, um, nerve block uh, needles when they're echogenic, that's how these anesthesia uses. So I mean to look out for it. Um, hoping also get a pretty big consent form on clinical monsters, something that will just save us time. Right? Um, there's a lot of QI projects, you know, um, Annette and Jordan are working on stuff. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for a sim. So I think there's a lot of stuff we can do with nerve blocks. All right, so recap, again, treat pain, do blocks, um, preparation, make sure you do a good neurovascular exam, um, do the indications, contraindications, um, make sure you're practicing the technique, do a good in-plane blocks, hydrodissection, know your safe doses of local anesthetics whenever you're doing a block, um, and then recognize the complications. Some resources, this guy, Revel, um, he is, um, he's, he's a good resource, he loves doing blocks, so we never run shift with them, um, or any of the other sound faculty or any faculty. Um, we try to do um, blocks. There's some websites. My store is a really good resource. Um, they have a lot of great, uh, we'll talk, we'll talk through the steps of time to do each block, so that's a great resource. Uh, Highland also has a good website for doing blocks. Um, and then Five Minute Sano and the block. Here's some references. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, just, I know of a death from uh, Levivacaine. Be very careful with Levivacaine. Always with all of them, before you inject, always pull back and make sure you're not in the vessel. I've seen another with seizures given an arrhythmia from lidocaine where someone didn't do that. The other alternative is you, that, as you mentioned, they may not be allergic to lidocaine and may be the preservative. The way you can get around that is you can use the cardiac lidocaine that we use for arrhythmias that doesn't have a preservative in it. And finally, one alternative, if you're worried about they may be allergic, you're not sure which anesthetic by their history, for local anesthetic, you can use Benadryl, so good local anesthetic. Um, so I'm not sure if you're, but basically we're saying to, again, pull back um, uh, in case you're not doing intravascular injection. Um, and then talked about, you can also use uh, Benadryl, uh, local, what <laughs> the, car, the cardiac, the cardiac, 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 cardiac uh, right. So you can also use the cardiac lidocaine. Doesn't have uh, to preserve it. Doesn't have to preserve it. Thanks. Any more coffee? Yeah. Talk. Well, a um, <clears throat> couple points. Uh, in terms of, obviously, I don't know if we're going to be getting the uh, anesthesia needle, but for the faculty, not need a long needle, the final needle is kind of the way to go for that because you're not going to find a needle that's long enough. Um, and in terms of, uh, communicate is really mostly useful for something you want long term. That's usually going to be the bacheliac. And the advantage to the bacheliac is that it's not near any vessels. Um, so, and, and that's the one that's going to be the most volume. Of, of the anesthetic that you can use. And it, it, no matter which um, version of the cane, what um, mixture is it that they send you, it's, it's unlikely that you're going to hit a toxic dose with whatever the 20, 25 cc that you're going to be uh, using. But I will say that before you do any block for a fracture, please discuss with ortho. Um, if, you know, sometimes they want to do the exam. There's some, you know, stuff out there saying it really doesn't affect the exam, but you know, they might want to, they might have some sensory changes with the block and then that's going to uh, impact more those ability to do a neurovascular exam. We already had a lecture today on how important that is. So um, make sure you call ortho and discuss with them to allow them to evaluate the patient before you do the block. Uh, and, and that's, that's a, another important uh, point. Especially at the blocks really work. When my husband broke his hip, um, one of our former residents was at the fellowship at Methodist, and he did a special at the block for us. And uh, it was like the one thing that really helped him. It's, it's like the fentanyl and morphine just made him dizzy. Mm -hmm. He's a big fan of Toradol and the block. <laughs> just to, uh, I, was, I put it in the chat, yeah. <laughs> Just a question that you come, come across or if anyone has any opinions about it. I feel like one of the big barriers to doing this outside of an academic setting is the time. Right? It's so much easier to order a fentanyl or morphine if you're working in a busy community. 
I was wondering if you came across any uh, literature or anything about the difference in time of, of, the, of the provider doing these things. And I guess to piggyback on that, anything about uh, the financial aspect of it. Like, obviously, it takes more time, but can you build for RVUs and uh, uh, get reimbursement for this too? So that, that could be something that helps out. That. Yeah, so um, Wolsey was asking um, any literature about the time. I, I think there still needs to be studies done um, talking about this. I think one argument you can make is that your patient who is constantly moaning in pain for 12 hours, you're going back, the nurse is always calling for you. If you do one block, maybe it takes more time to do that block, but you're going to be set for the rest of the night. Um, also, uh, so that's what I would say. Um, I, guess, I guess the argument against that, if I'm working in a busy community, that patient would be in front of me all night. They're probably going to go upstairs. Yeah, that's true. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, we work in an academic yeah. setting, and I think, I agree, we should be doing these, and you guys should be doing them, but it's just thinking about future practice and the majority of practice out there, why this is probably not picking up as much traction. I think, this, you go ahead. Yeah, well, time is something we have a little bit of control over. I mean, the procedure's going to take over as long the procedure takes. Yeah. That's going to depend on how, how facile you are but a little bit. But then, you know, if you're not running all over the place looking for supplies, so you need to come to me with a uh, proposal, you know, how we could fix that. So, you know, yeah. if you can put a kit together, you mentioned it, right? But maybe it's maybe we need two or three kits. I don't know if it's the same kit each time. Yeah. But, you know, if you're looking, you know, if you're running all over the ED, you look for yeah. six different, okay. right? Like, yeah. you know, it takes me. Two minutes to do a finger block and take you twenty minutes to, to get everything, you know, put the bucket together. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, I, I know some places have like these kits that are already with like the ultrasound. Um, I know anesthesia they're trying to purchase a bundle like the app for centralized. So maybe that's something that um, I'm trying to work with Blue Island about getting that, getting that for us. So something that we could, if it's cost effective, you know, cost of the major, uh, so we can't argue there. I agree. So I, yeah, I don't know how long, how expensive those anesthesia needles are, what the RV was, if that's something we should. I, think, I mean, I think that's a good point you bring up too, Robbie, and might be more functional places if you go work somewhere else. You can uh, you can get an anesthesia console. They have like pain consultants, so they could come down and do a block, and that might be a good mm -hmm. I think the other community, a lot of your RVs and your bonuses are based on your prestige course. Too. So, if you give adequate pain control, um, that will help in that aspect. I don't know if they're admitted. Yeah, I haven't read the like, My guess is somewhere out there about like, and from the hospital, I understand the point that you know, the time saving and money saving is, you know, from a hospital standpoint, okay, maybe we can develop this charge two days quicker. So I think if you need to have like 
be a buy-in from other departments. Yeah, we develop a plan with the other departments in Asia, Bertha. So I think that's the best way to actually make a good change, but it's a good point. Yeah. And just, it's not either or, um, and make sure you reevaluate the patient, because you know, you have a patient with hip fractures, the, the best of the other clock is great when it works, it doesn't work 100% of the time, you may not get into the into the space properly, and it, it depends on where the fracture is, especially the other can have better coverage than, let's say, the direct femoral nerve block, but um, reevaluate your patient. Don't just like do the block, drop the ultrasound probe, and walk away. And be like this patient's good; they don't need any more pain for the rest of the night. Um, go back because they might still be in pain. They might actually still need uh, systemic uh, analgesics, uh, and, and and that's also a really important. Also, please don't drop the probe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome.